tell me when. Hello and welcome to High Life Music Deconstructed, a five-part series where we delve into Ghana's iconic past of High Life Music. My name is Abna Sewa and I'm the founder of Akadi Magazine, an online publication designed to connect Ghanaians in the diaspora and the motherland. I'm joined by Bernard Johnson Taki, the creative director of the Golden Stool Project, and together we'll be exploring um, the high life scene between the 1950s and 1970s. This is episode two, we are live. So if you hear um, ice, cream truck. ice cream truck screaming children, it's because <laughs> we're live. <laughs> so please bear with us if that happens. Um, welcome to everyone here. If you were here last time, we were here two weeks ago. Um, we give you a big thank you and welcome. And if you're new, hopefully you will enjoy this hour and a half of exploring the history. Before we go into it, I want to welcome Bernard officially. Welcome, Bernard. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you for having me again. Yes, thank it's you. really good to see you. And Bernard, you're going to talk to us a little bit about the Golden Stool Project. Yes. Um, so anyway, those who don't know, um, my name is my name is Bernard and my DJ name is Water 45. Um, I run the Golden Stool Initiative, which um, designed, is designed to actually um, promote and encourage the Ghanaian arts. Um, our main aim, or yes, one of our main aims is to have a comprehensive recording of um, traditional traditional music from all the four corners of Ghana. And we've actually set off that project with our recordings. And I was in Ghana last year. Um, and yeah, it's, it's looking good. It's looking good so far. But so far, um, yes, we're, we're glad to be doing High Life Music Deconstructed. Thank you, Bernard. Can you tell us a little bit about why it's important for us to be archiving and holding on to our narr narrative? Um, I think it's really important that we hold on to our narrative or we tell the story from from our perspective because I think um, culture in itself it's it's innate in every person and that is your identity. To be honest, that's yeah. that's who you are. So it's very important that you hold that dear to, to, to your heart. And for me, that really, really matters. Thank you. So when we spoke before for episode one, you gave us a, a little potted history of high life from the early 1900s, around 1920, up until the 1940s. Yep. And I think this time we're going to be touching on 50s, as you said, to 70s. Early 70s, yeah. late 60s, early 70s. So can you give us an idea of what you'll be covering today? Um, yes. So um, to make it easier for, 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 for everybody to actually follow and understand, I've split it into seven very, very brief sections. So um, everybody sort of gets gets the the broader picture so first of all we'll be looking at the initial split that took place within high life there were two distinct streams um say after the 1940s early 50s um we'll be taking an in-depth look at um dance dance bands, bands. we'll be taking an in-depth look at um guitar um sorry high life dance bands um, and then thirdly, we'll be taking a look at um, high life guitar bands. Those were the two streams that formed out. Um, we'll further be looking at elitism within within high life. Um, we'll be looking at the gradual um, um, demise of, of, of the big band style of high life, the reasons that caused that demise. And then finally, we'll be looking at um, the socio-political conditions that existed within Africa in general and Ghana in particular around that time, 1940s, 1950s to, to late 50s. And then finally, we'll be looking also at the structures that supported these, these musicians of the second generation. So we have got a, a fair bit to go through, but I know that it's going to be interesting. Um, yes, it will be very, very interesting. Okay. <laughs> so just to start off, are we going to start off with a... a yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I knew you were excited about this because <laughs> when I played this record earlier, I mean, you, you, you were so excited about it. Yes. So um, to kick things off, I am going to play some music and I have decided to pick a record... Um, from the late 50s, actually. 
and this is on the Taga record label. A plethora of record labels sprang up, in the, especially in the 70s. We'll talk more about that in the third generation. And this is by T.O. Jazz, led by um, Thomas, Thomas um, um, Ampoma, who was from Kumasi, a very, very notable figure on the guitar, um, the, the guitar, high life guitar band scene. So this is called um, um, Mibroni, which literally means my, my love, my, 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 my cherished one. Okay. okay. So um, we're going to play this song and right after this song, um, we are going to carry on. So if you could just give me a sec, I'll just get it going. a track by T.O. Jazz. Is that right? Um, yes, T.O. Jazz. And yes. it was Mibru Mibruni, which means cherished one. Yeah, that was yeah. definitely T.O. Jazz. Two, two things that I really liked about that was just the really deep bass. The yeah, guitar bass. I think, I think um, 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 the bass line on this, on this, on this particular track is, is what makes it really special to me as well. So um, it's, it's the rawest form of um, guitar high life guitar band music which we'll talk about later yeah. yes but teal jazz and also i could hear a, a woman singing yes so um as we've always said we will try our, as much as possible to to show the feminine side of high life as well it's always been mm. the men and um the lead singer's name is Irama, and she sang with teal jazz she was one of the the lead singers for teal jazz awesome so let's get started, people. As I um, have said in, in the previous episode, if you have any comments or questions, just note them down and we will be, you know, picking that up at the end of the 
uh, the session. So let's start. In terms of this split that you talked about with High Life Music, you talked about the band, dance band, and then you talked about guitar bands. Let's start with dance band. Um, I think the main reason why the, the, the split occurred um, was because you've got, you've got the musicians that play in the dance bands, and these guys played in more plush locations. So they'd be playing in the, the top hotels in town. They'd be playing in the best ballrooms in town. Yeah. And you had the other side of the story, which were the guys who could not afford to go to those really um, outrageously expensive places. So they sort of incubated their sound mm. in the palm wine shacks. And that became guitar band music. So one was one strand was for the, the wealthy, mm. um, sort of the black elite, the colonialist. The other side was for the man who, who, who lived down the road, who just wanted to have a good time. Yeah. So that was how these two distinct streams came about. And they sort of operated concurrently. They run side by side each other for probably the next 10, 15 years. Okay, then. That's really interesting. Well, if we start off with dance bands, mm -hmm. um, could you talk to us about how you know they were composed in terms of the, the band? Well, so if one sort of spoke of, 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 of a high-life dance band, um, okay, to begin with, in terms of headcount, in terms of numbers, you're looking at anything up to about 20 musicians. That's a lot. <laughs> at a time. And if you look at the individual makeup as well, um, 20 musicians, emphasis was on the horn section. So you could easily have a 12 horn section. Easy. Mm. You're looking at three trumpets, three trombones, um, three saxophones, probably a couple of types of saxophones, so maybe the tenor and the alto. Yeah. And then you've got um, probably the regular steel flute and then an assortment of, of local flutes. So that alone, plus a rhythm section, full drum kit, um, bass, two guitars. And you might get probably maybe a four-man percussion section as well because you'd have um, one musician on, on the congas, you'd have someone on the bongos, which is actually not African. Where is it from? The bongos are actually, um, an, is, is actually an instrument that you find in mainly um, Latin America. Okay. So you find a lot in Cuba, Venezuela, Venezuela and, it's, and it's associated with like um, Afro-Latin music. Mm. So you'd have one guy on that and then you'd have two people on shakers. So it was, it was, it was, it was an ensemble. It was a big ensemble. And yeah. it sounds like it, you would have, it would have generated a really rich sound if you've got all of that. Going. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was... The sound was big. It was bold. It was just brash because you've had this really lush, sort of huge horn section and the mm. sonics you get from, from loads of horns, different types of horns, it's just so rich. Okay. So where would these bands be performing? Um, so I think in, in, in Ghana back then, it was fashionable for every, every city to have a, it's, its own dance band, you know? So if you go up to Kumasi, you have, you have the Stargazers and they'll be playing maybe at the Kingsway Hotel. Um, you come to Accra, which is obviously the capital of Ghana. Um, there's a famous Seaview Hotel. Okay. You know? it, it's, it's actually in Jamestown. Isn't that near where you're from? Well, well, <laughs> well yeah. It's not. It's not far from where I live because I live on a mortuary road. So it's it's not too far from where where like I grew up or where my mum lives now. Mm. And and you had bands like the Ramblers and the Black Beats. They would be playing at at, at the CV Hotel, you know. And mm. you'd have all the really elite black people. The, the Western Europeans that were either governors or held really okay. high office would come to Hobnob. And that was just right opposite the lighthouse. Oh, I know the lighthouse. Yep. Yeah. That's right opposite the lighthouse, but I think that's gone now. Yeah, I don't recall when I <laughs> went there seeing it. But I mean, if anyone knows or if anyone was around when, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and then in... Takaradi as well, which was a port city, actually. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you had the Atlantic Hotel and then you had the Broadway dance band doing their thing there. So, yeah, these were, they, these were places that they played, really high society, very opulent, rich. It's like 
the equivalent of like going to Mayfair. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's all nice and plush and proper. And I, I guess you would have had to dress the part to get in. Well, well. of course. I mean, th there was a, th there was a whole European etiquette where you needed the suit and 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 the tie and you, you had to look good. I mean, in Accra, you had to go to someone like Dan Morton for him to make a suit for you, so you could you could actually go to those those grand yeah. balls. So you'd have to um, earn a pretty penny. Yes, you would have to earn yeah. a pretty penny. Yes. Okay. So in terms of foreign influences in that kind of music, um, what were they? Um, I think in terms of foreign music, um, there was one particular sort of music form that really took root then, because bear in mind, during the Second World War, um, Western countries had their armies like stationed all over the world. And we obviously had uh, military men mm. from the United States and we had soldiers from, 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 from Europe all stationed in Ghana. And uh, what was in vogue back then was swing and big band jazz, mm. you know, very US, US centric, yeah. tinged kind of, kind of sound. Um, and you as big band jazz and swing had a massive, massive, massive influence on these um, dance band musicians because they were listening to artists like Duke Ellington, mm. Count Basie, yeah. you know, Lionel Hampton, Benny Goodman, yeah. you know, King of Swing. So that had an influence. They were even listening to Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones and jazz? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's not what I associate him with. But. Well, I mean, for those of you who, who actually don't know, Quincy Jones started his career as, as a trumpet player for Lauder Hampton. I mean, oh, for like wow. three, four years, he played trumpet for Lauder Hampton. And he went on to actually arrange and compose for Count Basie, Duke Ellington. So it was very possible that, I mean, if you were listening to a top hit, by, by by Count Basie in the mid fifties. It, it must have been nine out, eight out of ten times. It must have had the hand of Quincy Jones in there. And then I guess if if um, Ghanaians were listening to the you know Count Basie songs at that time, that would have been, you know, linked to uh, Quincy Jones arranging those songs. Well, possibly. I mean, if you were listening to a Count Basie song, yeah. it, it could be possible Quincy Jones had actually arranged it. Okay. You know, and that in itself was quite amazing. We had Louis Armstrong yeah. visited Ghana in 1956. Yes. And that was a momentous occasion. You know, obviously the guys who played in the guitar bands were sidelined because they were not regarded as quite... God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't have corona. <laughs> this one is... <laughs> They they were not they, they were not sort of deemed as 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 posh enough. So Louis Armstrong paid a visit to Ghana in 1956. It was he had a gig at the stadium, yeah. and all the all the musicians swarmed around him. Even E. T. Mensa had a club on Barclays Road. I don't know whether that exists today, and um, called the Paramount Club. Okay. And that was where he hosted um, um, Louis Armstrong with a full band. Wow. You know, so even when you listen to um, some of, of some of the compositions of some of the some of the dance band greats, mm. the horn lines, the horn structures, especially the way they structure the horns, yeah, it's it's so jazz like. Oh wow! You know, it's pure jazz. Even the way they dr even the some of the drumming sequences, yeah. Although it's heavily sort of this they're singing in a can. Yeah. The melodies are obviously Ghanaian. Yeah. But the main groove itself, the horn lines were so identical so to what to what to what to what the big bands yeah. did. And that was a massive influence at that point in time. Now I remember from episode one, um you mentioned about the crew merchants and you talked about the um Caribbean sailors and the influence that they brought with the guitar. Yeah. So I mean We've talked about jazz, but what about the Caribbean music? Um, Caribbean music would, I think, at that time, late 40s to mid 50s, um, Caribbean music would be Calypso. Okay. You know, because you had, you, you had all, the, all, the, all the heavyweights like Mighty Sparrow and Lord Kitchener who were, who were famous in the Caribbean. And 
I think Lord Kitchener's visit as well to Ghana mm. in in 1956 also galvanized that relationship in the sense that he took to he took to like in high life as well to the extent that he composed one of our our our, our independent songs which is Ghana Freedom. Yeah. You know, it was it was high life but more in a in a very calypso like yeah. calypso like um sort of vein yeah i remember listening to that and thinking i wouldn't have associated the two together you know well i mean the the really I, I think the relationship between sort of caribbean music and ghanaian music and ghanaian musicians i mean goes back a long way i mean they introduced the guitars mm. you know they were the the, the the sailors that came and introduced the guitars they, they 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 brought calypso you know and even let's put into let's even put it in today's into into today's context um in ghana dance hall is big yeah massive yeah i mean some of the best pop stars or the most famous pop stars in ghana at the moment are dance hall musicians yeah that's true you've got what's his name Sha shatawale shatawale stone, stone boy, boy episode what's the other what's the other guy's name i forgot the other guy's name he's, he's a really <laughs> popular ras cuckoo his name is ras cuckoo a really popular one as well and this is caribbean music yeah i mean let's face it it's yeah. it's, it's, it's dance hall is a caribbean yeah. phenomenon so yeah. that relationship has always been there it's, yeah. it's always been there yeah but i don't get the impression when you when mm. i compare it to jazz that the calypso took hold am i right am i wrong um <sighs> Well, Calypso, definitely musicians, other high life musicians. You had people like Yamwes Band. Um, you had um, bands like um, Nyame Betre, who played Calypso like high life. Mm. But it never actually blew up, if, yeah. if, you, if you know what I mean. It wasn't like, like the big band jazz that totally obliterated everything else. Mm. Did, this one did not have that potency okay i think this is mainly due to to probably the fact that um calypso is quite lyrical yeah you know it's quite lyrical in the sense that if mighty spyro is singing for instance the emphasis is on what he's is is mainly on what he's saying mm. because that is more or less him telling a story whereas jazz is highly rhythmic you know and i think we Ghanaians as as normal people are rhythm is in bond you know so i think that difference of jazz being highly rhythmic and calypso being more or less quite lyrical created that shift in the sense that people did not cotton on to it too much mm. you know so i think that is the main reason why calypso sort of never made it through okay to heavy commercial success. Okay. But today, dancehall has. Yeah, yeah, we can see that. So, who are the big hitters that you can tell us about? The band, the big band. Oh, the big band. So, in terms of the dance bands, I mean, we had a plethora of dance bands because it was, it was, it was, it was quite. It was a thing of the day. If you wanted to be in or you wanted to be cool, you there had to be a dance band around you. So we had um, the famous. Count Bonsu. I mean, look at the name, Count Bonsu. It was first Count Bonsu and his trio, mm. right? And then it became Count Bonsu and the Modern Airs Dance Band. Well, Count Bonsu, <laughs> it sounds like Count Basie. Well, I'm sure he saw himself back in the day as some sort of... I'm, a, I'm an amazing composer, you know, I can write amazing songs and I've got these amazing musicians playing for me. Yes, I might as well <laughs> name myself... Um, the Count. Um, so you had um, Jerry Hansen and um, Jerry Hansen was running the beats, um, the Black Beats, mm. um, E.T. Mensa and the Ramblers International. Um, you had um, the Red Spot, Tommy Gripman. Mm. Tommy Gripman and the Red Spots. Um, you had the Broadway Dance Band. Yeah. And then you had the my favorite, the Uhuru Dance Band. Okay, so Uhuru, that doesn't sound very Ghanaian. Swahili, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Uhuru, Uhuru is, is, is Swahili. So Uhuru um, 
was formed by members of the Broadway Dance Band. Okay. And the Broadway Dance Band was based in Takoradi. Okay. In the plush Atlantic Hotel. So some of these members um, sort of came together and formed the Uhuru Dance Band. And the name Uhuru came about because it, that was in 1957. Um, just at the cusp of, of independence. Of independence. Okay. So the king of Esikado, um, which is a, I think is a principality in the central region, mm. conferred the name um, Uhuru onto this sort of this new this new outfit that had just been formed by members of the Broadway band to actually reflect the current status of the time. You okay. Know? We are who we are. Yeah. We are found ourselves. We're dropping Broadway. And now we're Uhuru dance band. And Uhuru means? Freedom. Okay. So it kind of fits in with this idea it, of... It fits in perfectly with that narrative of we are who we are and <laughs> we can manage our own affairs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I see that. Okay, so Uhuru, a very big band. But I think, um, how did that sort of evolve? Did it not move on? And mm, Uhuru, in the sense that, to me, once again, I said Uhuru is a, is, is a very special sort of band. So when Uhuru was firm, first formed out of, out of the Broadways in 1957, um, the, the leader then, who was Stan Plange, famous, famous, amaz amazing musician, mm. he had left when Uhuru formed. Um, so Sami Obot, who is okay. a Nigerian, okay. actually took the reins and sort of became the leader of Uhuru. I mean, for a Nigerian to actually be leading a dance band, that tells you that that connection we have with Nigeria is is you you can never break that that connect that musical connection that we have we have, we have with Nigeria. I think people think of Fela and then Ghana, you know that. But it sounds like what you're saying is it was even before that. Exactly, it was even before 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 that. You know, before mm. before Fela came to actually do his understudy <laughs> in Ghana. So um, some of the members that were like the original members that you had in 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 the Broadway dance band, which was it was quite huge. So you had people like George Emisa, who went on to be one of the most in demand saxophone players in the seventies. Mm. I mean, that was that was a, that was a that was an interestingly different era of the seventies. But we'll talk more about that. So you had people like George Emisa, who, who was a great saxophonist. You had um, Lassisi Amau, Lauti Lassisi Amau, another Nigerian who was a bass player. Mm. Um, you had Mark Tonto. Yeah. Everybody knows Mark yep. Tonto. You had Jedouble Ambule. Oh wow. Yep. Jedi Blair Humble, yeah, Abel Taylor. Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> the mysterious man Oscar Sule. Why is he mysterious? Well, Oscar Sule is is, is he's not he, he's mysterious because I mean there was a song that was released of him called Buko Mashi, and apparently it was unreleased, and that song is is a killer. Okay, you do know? you have it? I I do have Buko Ooh. Mashi. <laughs> So, um, well, can I just say if anybody knows anything about <laughs> Oscar Sule, <laughs> let, let Bernard know. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so these were some of the people that you had, like George Dankwa as well, had a, had a stint there. Charlotte Dada, one of the most important female vocalists from the big band era, yeah, also played with the Uhurus, you know. So, Uhuru to me is. Is, 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 is a boiling pot of immense talent. Yeah, it sounds like it. You know, and I can say that without, um, without Uhuru, Ghana would probably, would not have had <laughs> its first, in no, 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 seriously. Without Uhuru, Ghana probably would not have had its first international breakthrough act. If I say international, I mean, yeah, the works. Okay. You know, let, let, let me try and break that down so you understand it. <laughs> Mark Tonto. Yes. He played with Uhuru. Yes. He played with Usibisa. Yes. Lassisi Amau, he was a bass guitarist for mm -hmm, Usibisa. Mm -hmm. Daku Potato. <laughs> he I was a conga name. player. He was a conga player for Usibisa. And another big band, Stargazers. Yeah. Teddy Osei played in Stargazers. So look at these four sort of four pillars of, of Osibisa, you know. Oh. All of them had stints with dance bands. Majority of them had stints with Uhuru. Obviously, Teddy came from the Stargazers. 
So to me, that was their incubator. Yeah. That was where they honed their skills until they came to London and then sort of started up in Ten Panali in Soho. Oh, wow. And they blew up. So seriously, I think it's quite important. Without Uhuru, there probably wouldn't have been Osibisa in its form that we know it today. Yeah. And I think you referred to it as Afro rock. Yes, I mean Afro rock. I mean the Sibisa, they created that. They 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 took that genre Afro rock from Africa, you know, with African vibes yeah. to international standards. So know. so I know that some of us will know some of their tracks like Welcome Home and Sunshine Day and I think you can name some more that I don't know. But yeah, yeah. 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 So okay. yeah. Yeah, carry on. Sorry, I'm just grabbing the next record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, so that's amazing. But I, I want to go back to women because we can't forget the role of women in yeah. this genre as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. We definitely, one second. Yeah, carry on, sorry, sorry. Women. Yes, women, yes. Women. Women, sorry, beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can't forget the role of women um, on the on the High Life Dance um High life dance band scene. Yeah. Women played a pivotal role. I mean, once again, dating back or tracing it back to what I said about women in traditional music. Yeah. Um, as I said, the space for them to perform changed. You know, bands became places of of ill repute. Ill repute. I think that's it what was you like said. it was it was associated with all sorts of negative things that we as a conservative society, i.e. Ghana, yeah. we do not tolerate. But yes, still, certain women were able to break through and those women were able to stand in front, mm. you know, not backing singers. They were able to stand in front and actually sing, you know. They were, they were able to get authorization for band leaders to say, okay, you, you can sing. Yes, you had women like Charlotte Dada, who was with, with the Uhurus. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. She was with the Uhuru Dance Band. Um, you had Gladys Kesua, who was with the Ghana Police Dance Band. You know, isn't Lee Dodu in the Ghana Police? Lee Dodu was in the Ghana Police yeah. Dance Band as well. Police Dance Band. So, um, these women, like these two women, actually were trailblazers yeah. in a way because they were able to show people that, yeah, we can do it, Yeah, you know? So the, the role of women can definitely not be underestimated at all so far as um, well, dance bands are concerned. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And I think on this note, I feel like we should hear some music to reflect. Well, yes. I mean, to reflect what we've just said, we are going to hear some music because... I have just spoken about jazz being a massive influence. American, especially US jazz and big band jazz and yeah. swing, having a massive influence in the way guitar, sorry, in the way dance band leaders composed and actually arranged. Mm. So I've got a record here, which is from the Builders Brigade Band. It's, it's a big band. So there we go. Which, which camera is it? Is it that one or that one? That one. <laughs> And I think Patrick is going to flip it over. Patrick's our producer. <laughs> Patrick is going to flip it over. And then um, I, will, I will try and look for the track whilst you say something. <laughs> <laughs> so just to remind you, if you are new to this platform, this is our second episode. Um, our first one, we covered the beginnings, the origins of Ghanaian high life. And we're talking about music, high life music between 1950s and the early 1970s. If you've got any questions, comments, please drop them in the comment box and we'll be reading them out later on. Are you ready for yes, us? Yes, yes, I'm ready. Okay, so um, this record is from the Builders Brigade, Builders, Builders, Bri Builders Brigade. Brigade. Band. band and it was a very popular dance band um in the mid 50s and this is a this is a track that is really special because the whole of that album is big band sort of high life style like dance band big band high life style but this particular track is more like a jazz track and i just wanted i'm just using this track to actually show you how much US jazz, big band jazz, influenced high life. So this track is called Hoha. Hoha. Hoha, yeah. Okay, so we'll try and get it underway.
Hello and welcome back to High Life Music Deconstructed. My name's Abena and I'm with Bernard. He's the creative director of the Golden Stool Project. You were just listening to Hoha by the Builders Brigade, Brigade Band. Band yeah. Yes. I mean, that was really smooth. I could really feel the jazz in that song. Um, yeah, I mean, that this is exactly what I was trying to um, demonstrate, the fact that um, the influence of jazz, so far as high life is concerned, is is massive. I mean, people like Ibo Taylor can still sort of contest to that because yeah. he's confirmed that he used to listen to Grant Green, who was a famous jazz guitarist, you know, so... We can't take that away from it, for sure. No, well, it, it's definitely imprinted in that song. I like it. It's really nice. Um, so we have touched on um, dance bands. So let's move over to guitar bands, which you said was running concurrently. So what was the difference with um, the sort of dance band scene at the time? Well, um, so as, 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 as I've said previously, um, the guitar bands emanated from those palm wine shacks because they couldn't afford to be posh <laughs> 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 they definitely could not afford to be posh so um the major difference between the 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 dance bands and the guitar band so let's we're talking about the guitar bands now yeah. so a guitar band would consist of in terms of head count much less people okay um a very big um guitar band would have eight people wow just eight with six they can still tear off the roof with six well that is a big difference you said about 20 didn't you yes i said about about mm. 20 because it was it's, it's 100 percent modeled on u.s big bands yeah. you know the, the more the merrier you okay. know but these guys were quite slim <laughs> 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 and 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 the music that they played was mainly guitar led. Okay. And early dance bands had no horns. Okay. Th there was no brass yeah. whatsoever. It was purely guitar led. So talk to us about the composition then. Um in terms of the way these guys went about their compositions and where they got inspirations from to write all sorts of very interesting songs. Um I think they mainly got their inspiration from traditional music. Yeah. That was the main source of inspiration. And the way they composed was mainly by ear mm. or by feel. Okay. That and by memory. So that I'm I'm guessing with the um dance bands they were sort of more music Yes, trained? they were they were more schooled. Yeah. You know, most of them could read the, the with the dance bands, most of them could read music, most of them could write, most of them could score. But with the guitar bands, I'd say seventy percent of them had no formal music education whatsoever. Wow. But still they could come up with very intricate compositions. You know, compositions that are so intricate Sometimes it even boggles music experts to say to, to actually think, hold on, how do these people remember all these sequences? How do they remember all these structures? And that is where the power of memory comes in. Comes in, you know, and the power of just being a natural musician comes in. Because I, I guess there's this um, perception that if you can read music and all of that, that you're a better musician than somebody who can't. But you're you're. So, you know, you're highlighting and there's proof with all the music that we have that that's not the case. Well, I mean, t to be honest with you, let's face it. A fair majority of of Africa's greatest musicians were not musically schooled, mm. you know. Um, that does not mean that you can't be a great musician. You know, it depends on... It doesn't mean you can't be a great musician because you've got loads and loads of musicians out there who can read a note but they, they they would play the hell out of you mm. you know so to me i think is it a barrier no not really no you know i don't think it's much of a barrier if you can't read and write and that doesn't make you a lesser musician as well no not at all i mean you're talking about this um prowess that they had in creating music can you give us examples of some of the bands um, so some of the bands that were quite popular back in the day in terms of guitar bands, 
Um, another thing we should, so uh, another comparison I want to make uh, between those two sort of streams would be the the issue of discipline. You know, okay. discipline amongst 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 musicians. With the big bands, it was very regimented. You know, you had to. There's loads of you. So to be able to produce good sounds in unison, mm. there has to be a fair amount of discipline amongst each and every man yeah. to get that desired output. So the dance bands were more or less very regimented. You know, the leaders were taskmasters. You know, they drive you to death. <laughs> You know, the, the, so someone like the, the, I've heard stories of instances of of Kim Bruce finding his musicians wow. when they made mistakes during rehearsals, and even finding you more <laughs> when you played a gig. Okay, well that's fair. <laughs> that's like live gig. I'll, I'll find you more, but being fined is not cool. So that is it. Is is that regimented sort of almost military operation style, whereas with the guitar bands it was more loose yeah you know but that doesn't mean that they the looseness affected the quality of the output no the output was even trust me amazing i think you mentioned when we were off camera that some of the records when you buy them the, the songs that cost the most are the songs that are played by the guitar band. well yeah i mean personally i think the guitar band f f as a record collector um Guitar band seven inches, like proper guitar band seven inches, cost a lot more than big band high life um, dance band wow. records. So that is one of it. that's that's one thing as well. Okay. Um. So in terms of what you said of who were the stars of the yes. day, so you had um E K Nyame, he was the first musician out of the Palm Wine Sharks to actually plug in, i.e. electric guitar. Okay. He was the first guitar band high life musician to actually use an electric guitar so he went on to form EK's number one with Kakeku everybody knows Kakeku I don't <laughs> <laughs> everybody knows Kakeku so he went on to form EK's number one with with no not not, not Kakeku sorry Kwabuna Okai oh, okay. I take that back See. it was Kwabuna Okai and <laughs> EK Nani. they went on to form EK's number one and then we had Yamwe's band. Yeah. Another with Ajeku. I, I think Ajeku, he died not long ago, actually. Ajeku is like one of the most underrated guitar band singers, like totally underrated. Why? Why is he underrated? Um, I think he wasn't, I wouldn't say he wasn't giving more credit, but I mean, to me, I think he should have had more exposure. He should okay. have cut more records. Um, you had the enigmatic KJC. Not, oh. not, not just KJC, he was actually called Doctor. Doctor. So Do he, he was he a medical doctor? <laughs> no, he was a doctor of high life. Oh, that yes. other doctor. Yes. Okay. So that was that was Dr. KJC. Um, you had Master Bob Aquaboa. Oh, wow, yeah. So the Aquaboa family, that really famous music family in, in Ghana, his son, he's just called Aquaboa. I don't know what his first name is. Isn't it Kwabna? No, no, that's not. Kwabna is his father. Oh, okay. So his son, so Bob Aquaboa's grandson, yeah. actually produced Sarkodius. Is it Sarkodius' last album? Mm. Is it? I think it was a dedication to do to his mother. Mother, yeah. And he produced the whole album. Anyway, those of you that don't know Sarkodius, yeah, Sarkodius is like, is it hip hop? Or hip, hip, yeah. hip hop? Yeah, I think he's a hip hop Afro. artist. And, I don't know, is it hip hop or hip hop? Anyway. I think, it, I think it's one of those hip things. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, and so his grandson produced that album and his son, Kwabuna Akwabwa, played in the Marriott's band, very popular band in the 80s. So it's a very musical family. Mm. You know, it's a, it's a very, very musical family. I like how you've tied it to modern day by showing how, you know, that sort of tradition has continued. Well, I mean, that... With that Kwabwa family, I think it's it's a special it's a, it's a very special um, family tradition because it began from the second generation yeah. all the way to now. Yeah. So it's to me it's quite unique. Showing well. the relevance still of high life yeah, music very, very, in very, whatever very, form. Very, 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 very relevant. And then you had Tio Jazz. Which we heard at the beginning. Yeah, and then there's Nyame Bechere band as well. 
So, I mean, with the guitar bands, there were loads. Okay. There were loads of guitar bands. Okay, so where were these guitar bands playing? Um, so, with these guitar bands, it's, it's amazing because, obviously, in the 50s, there were not sort of designated halls for everybody to play, mm. you know. So, the high life band, the, 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 the dance bands, they had the chance to play in all these hotels, um, all these plush sort of ballrooms. But with the guitar band sort of crew, they played a lot in sort of like made up sort of pop up places. Oh, <laughs> the early pop ups. <laughs> they played in pop up places. So I remember there was a place in Kaneshi called Akola Jaisu or some, some weird name like that, which means oh. little baby stop crying. There was another place called Impamprom that was tiptoe, you know, um, that, that was around circle. So these were like I open, hope these <laughs> names are ringing bells. With these people. were like open air places. These were these were not really plush. And then if you go much further into the hinterlands, because they didn't have these sort of open air spaces, and that was where you had most of the guitar bands from the hinterlands, so around the Ashanti region, the the Brongahafa region, you had a lot of them there. So there was this phenomenon of concert houses. What does that mean? <laughs> so a concert house is basically maybe within the community it could be a little town yeah there would always be a wealthy man yeah um coco crachi okay. which which means that that wealthy man is is a is a is a cocoa farmer or a cocoa broker yeah and normally they build huge houses which huge compounds yeah so what they would do is they would sort of rent out the the premises of their huge compounds to these bands these these guitar these touring little guitar bands yeah and they would turn up with with a little theater as well Okay. Concert, so they'd turn up with a theater. So um, the, the the band would basically provide the music, and then and you'd the, have people and, performing. And the, and the theater troupe would actually act it out. Oh, nice! You know, so it was mainly to do with morals. Okay. Um, sort of advice. You know, do 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 not steal from your brother. Um, it talks about love. Okay. It talks about how you don't get on with your mother-in-law. You think your mother-in-law is a pain Lovely in the bum. Lovely woman, yeah. <laughs> you know? So it was, it was mainly social commentary. And the guitar bands would provide the soundtrack. That is you know? awesome. So it, it was more like a, a, a traveling caravan of traveling music because it tore little villages. Yeah. And these theaters were based on minstrel shows from Europe. Okay. So they would literally black up. <laughs> And, and apply like white chalk around their lips. I mean, outrageous stuff, you know, have like um, the, 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 the pestle that you use for the apotariwa. Yeah. They have it around their necks and it was absolute mayhem. So just subverting stuff, subverting cultural norms. Like you don't use the etta for a bow tie. Exactly. It was, it was, it was, it was. Totally outrageous. It was a minstrel show. Okay, but one second. You said that Ghanaians were blacking up. Yep, yep. They were actually blacking so, up. So they're, they're adopting um, what was caricaturizing, if that's the word, ca um, white uh, ga black people in yep. Europe by yep. blacking up. Yep. And then in Ghana, they would take that, adopt it, and also black up. Yep, and that was the show. And that wasn't seen as, like, they didn't... I mean... <laughs> I think, I think I'm a kind of lost for words. I think there was no sense of political and social correctness back then. I mean, now you wouldn't dare do that. No. You know, now you wouldn't dare do that. But for them, it was just trying to imitate what they'd probably seen. Because bear in mind, there was there was early TV and it'd mainly be probably European shows. Yeah, yeah. So that what they've seen as a theatre and they've sort of incorporated it into their sort of local act as well to probably add a bit more edge. But political correctness, social correctness, zero. Yeah, I see that. So what? who were some of the big names at that time? Um, so some of the big names at that time, um, I, Yamwe's band. Yeah. Um, with Ajeku. Yeah. Um, Tio Jazz, um, the Akwabwa family. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned, I think, before about um, the guy with the etta. Oh kosher. yes, yes. So that was back to back to um, where we slightly digressed, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, so back to that 
sort of theater element and the blackface thing that I was talking about. So that, that setting in general, in that concert house, was referred to as concert parties. Yeah. You know, so these guitar bands would normally tour with these concert parties. Yeah. And that was, that was where they played. That was their main circuit of, of, of performance, you know, and they tour the hinterlands of Ghana with their act. And these bands were absolutely amazing. But looking deeper into it, that, that concert parties in those concert houses laid the foundation for drama on national TV. Okay. You know, most of the stars that were on the concert party circuit come the early 70s, mid 70s, they were superstars on TV. Okay, so it's kind of like that was the training ground for them? Well, it was. It was in a way because if if you're very well versed with Ghana TV, Osofodazi. Yeah. To give you a simple example, majority, the core of the Osofodazi drama troupe came from concert parties. Wow. You know? So in a way, those, the guitar bands provided the blueprint for the future of of drama series yeah. on, on Ghana TV. It's kind of interesting nice and nice how it's kind of like you see that shift and it's almost seamless. So the guitar band and performers, then you see them on TV and they're recognised and known by people. And um, I think you mentioned Dr. Jesse Dr. earlier. Dr. KJC. Yes. Um, so Dr. KJC is, is an interesting man. Um, in the sense that he was based in Kumasi and I even met his son. He, he's, he's passed away now, obviously, but um, I had the pleasure of meeting his son. Mm. Obviously, I bought some records of him. I can't go to Kumasi and not, of course. <laughs> and not go look for records. Um, KJC was like a honeypot for musicians. Okay. Because to begin with, apparently he was an, a very affable man. He was a very, a very philanthropic man as well. Okay. So he started off with the KJC guitar band. Yeah. And then later it morphed into KJC and the Noble Kings. Noble Kings? The Noble Kings, yeah. Okay. The Noble Kings. Um, KJC had a raft of musicians sort of come to his camp to study. Okay. You know, a raft of musicians... Um, he had someone like Charles Samoa, he played with KJC. Who else? Um, Eric Ajeman, he played with KJC. Thomas Frimpong. Oh, wow. He, he, he played with, yeah. he played with Nana Tufo of Blessed Memory. He played with, with, with KJC as well. And these sort of four people ended up being heavyweights during the Bogger High Life era. So it, again, another sort of training ground for a lot of the stars that we know yeah, or we grew up with. Exactly. A training ground, but at the same time, sort of a, it tells you what you learn from high life and where it can take you. Mm. You know, these people, somebody like Charles Samuel ended up playing disco sort of bogger high life sort of way. But I'm sure what he learned in Kumasi with KJC helped yeah. to shape that disco sound yeah. which we all know yeah. yeah yeah okay so what else is dr k jesse known for um k jesse as well was probably the first musician to introduce keyboards which is the organ okay into the guitar bands okay so that would have come from church would it well yes i mean the organ would have come from i mean because the word organ is normally used in african sort of sense yeah is church yeah yeah you know, so the organ must have come from 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 the church background. I'm sure he probably was a church musician once. Okay. Um, I don't know. Okay. And I think there's another type of high life ah, that he's known for. Sichi high life. I yeah. mean, it's it's quite good that you're you're bringing this up actually. So KJC invented the Sichi high life. Does then? <laughs> sorry, sorry. I just need to ask: Does anyone has anyone heard of this type of high life? If you have, please let us know. So tell us more about Sitchi. Okay, so Sitchi High Life is basically designed for the dance floor. Okay. So it's a medley of songs, which can go on. In terms of media, it can go on for fifteen minutes. Okay. Fourteen minutes, but in terms of a live band, it can go on forever. 
because okay. it's meant to make you dance. So it's just a medley of songs that have all been sort of melded into one long song. So when you start dancing, you, you don't, don't stop. stop. See, this <laughs> reminds me, um, anyone who's watching this, I used to go to Ghana Union parties. Um, you know, the song would start and then it would morph into another song and then another one. So is that an example of Sitchi High Life? Um, that is an example of of high life based on the Sichi style. Okay. Because 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 KJC had his own style of um of of rendering the Sichi high life. Okay. You know, the Yagin the the, the Yam Ponsa guitar was more prominent. Okay. Um he developed this mid seventies, so he'd added a full blown horn section as well. Okay. So the horn arrangements were nothing sort of it wasn't jazzy at all. It was pure traditional melodies. It was it was pure Ghanaian style of arrangements of the call the call and response was purely Asante, not even Ghanaian, I should put it that way. It was purely Asante. So that made him really special in that sense. And to me, I think, yeah, he's he's one of the greatest guitar band um band leaders to have ever graced and the you face said, of Ghana. And you said the godfather. Of, is he called the godfather? He's called the doctor. Oh, okay. Doctor. <laughs> <Sorry>. Doctor. <laughs> doctor KJC. So, yeah. Okay. Doctor of High Life. Okay, then. Um, before um, we, like, tie up this section, I think we should talk about women again in gu Guitar High Life. Yes, women in Guitar High Life. Um, in the same way that the band leaders of the dance bands gave women an opportunity, I think their counterparts in the guitar bands as well also gave women fair opportunity, if not more. Um, so you've got the Nananums who, or Nananum. Yeah, we talked about them in episode one, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, Nananum, they are from Kumasi. Yeah. And they were signed to um, the late George Perez Gapophone Records. And it was fronted by two women. And one of them was a, rab, a Rama. Okay. Who I think died not long ago, yeah. really, sort of. A Rama Bedu. Yes, that's the one. A Rama Bedu. Um, she was really popular i mean she even when she died I, I saw it in ghana web so that tells you yeah, she's big. how popular how mm. popular she was um you've got mumbi who sang with african brothers um nanam pedu himself referred to her as the golden voice of mother ghana wow yeah big accolade yeah um you've got um elia sabia cropper before she became big she was singing in the late 60s before she she made it big um, mm. um, um, in the eighties. Um, you've got um, other other singers who actually like Tio Jazz, the Which lead the, le the lead singer of Tio Jazz yeah. is also called Irama, yeah. and she was quite instrumental in sort of getting things, getting getting the women's point of view across so far as the music was concerned. Yeah. Okay, so fairly well represented. Well, I mean, it could have been more, but yeah. as you know, it's... A man's world. It's a man's world. <laughs> We're not being sexist or anything like that, but it's a man's world. Um, so what are you going to play for us right, now? Right, so what I'm going to play for you now is a typical guitar guitar band high life. Okay. So this is mainly guitar led and it's called the Royal Brothers. Um, let me see whether I can sort of... Get it going. Okay, so while Bernard is doing his DJ thing, I just want to remind you, if you do have any comments or questions that you want to put to him, we'll be taking them at the end of the show. So just write them in the comment box. Also, as a reminder, if you've not seen episode one, we have put a link in the box as well, and you can check that out afterwards, and we'll be doing the same with this one once we're done. So are you ready for us, um, Bernard? Yeah, I think we can go now. Okay. I am a country of you, not a country of 
Welcome back, everyone. You were just listening to Royal Brothers. You can definitely hear the guitar element in that song when you compare it to the dance uh, band song that you'd played earlier, Bernard. It's really, really nice. Um, one sec. Yeah, so this is um, the, Roy the Royal Brothers band, and this is typical guitar band high life music. Mm. You know, it's guitar led. The guitar was sort of front and center of, of, of the whole sonic of the sound. Um, this goes to show you probably the dexterity of high life guitarist um, during that era as well. So yeah, typical, I love it, Royal Brothers. Band. No, it's a good, it's a good track. Um, you touched on this before when we were talking about um, elitism in, in the sort of music. And I wanted to just touch on that again and go back and just sort of get you to explain why there was this sort of rivalry it seems <laughs> well um th this this um this rivalry thing has been actually been going on ever since those two streams realized oh we're two separate entities you know because you've got these really high class people playing at these really plush grand places and then you've got these guys who are doing concert parties yeah you know Concert party people or musicians couldn't even read and write music. I mean, probably 70% of them couldn't read and write. And you've got these sort of high class um, dance band people who have to wear like, um, what do you call it? What's the name of that famous tailor in Ghana? Dan Morton. Yeah. Yeah, they had to wear like nice Dan Morton suits. He was a Savoro of the time, by the way. Do you have one? <laughs> no, I, I got a shirt made at Dan Morton, actually. Oh, really? One time when I was in Next Ghana. Next time wear it for <laughs> us so that we can see. <laughs> so there was always this rivalry of like thinking that... The, the guys who played in the dance bands thinking, oh, we're, we're more superior than you. I mean, we play at the Atlantic Hotel or the Seaview Hotel. Where do you play? <laughs> in some, Somebody's in house. Some, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> in a concert house. And I was having a chat with Lee Dodu the other time, and he actually said, oh, um, um, musicians that used to play in, 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 in guitar bands were referred, to, were referred to as band boys. Band boys. Band boys. Okay. Which... I mean, back in the day, you wouldn't want your son to be called a band boy because that was quite, I don't know, slightly derogatory. You're a musician, you yeah. know, you're not, a, but hey, who am I? So that was where that sense of elitism played out. Okay. And it played out in certain places like the GBC as we, well, which was the, 
Ghana, Ghana Broadcasting, Broadcasting Corporation. And, and they, they would rather prefer to book um, dance bands for prime slots instead of, instead of guitar bands because mm. they would turn up like proper sharp suits, like tie, nicely polished shoes, mm. you know, very, very disciplined. And that sort of fit the image. Because we're talking about pre... Pre, pre, sort of... Independence. Pre, pre, pre-independence, you know, that sort of, that sort of fit the image. Okay. But I'm guessing that that was slowly shifting. If we're talking pre-independence, we're starting to move towards yeah, Ghana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. St- staking its claim on becoming independent. Yes. So what was the socio-political scene like in Ghana at that um, time? I think the socio-political scene... In the whole of Africa, mm. um, and Ghana in particular, was that of a yearning for self self governance. Yeah, you know, and when you look at the bigger picture, you had most of the future leaders that would lead most African countries to independence were studying either in communist Russia, um, the U.S., mm. or somewhere in Europe. Yeah, you know, you had leaders like um, Julius Nyerere, Kenneth Kaunda. Kwame Nkrumah, Sekuture. I mean, these people were like shining stars of Africa. Yeah. But before, before like the 50s, in the 40s, like for instance, Kwame Nkrumah was at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. And he experienced racism firsthand. Kwame Nkrumah experienced segregation, you know. Mm. He knew what it was like to be told, you cannot get on this bus because it's for only white people. Yeah. Or you cannot drink from that fountain because... It's only for white people, you know. He saw it firsthand. He lived in the era of Jim Crow. Yeah. You yeah. know, so when he came back, when leaders like that came back to Africa, so when Kwame Nkrumah came back to, to Africa and realized that, look, we deserve to be much more, we deserve to be respected, we, des- we deserve much more, that leaders like that used culture in this, in this, in this particular sense they used music as a political leverage, mm. you know, because first of all, let, 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 first of all, there has been a restored sense of pride. Yeah. You know, we are who we are. There is a restored sense of pride in your culture, pride in your traditions, pride in where you come from, mm. you know. So culture was being taken very seriously because as I said before, that's identity. Yeah, yeah. It's who you are. Without that, you'd be totally lost. So help us to connect that with the music, what was happening in certain African countries. So, for instance, um, in Secretary of Guinea, yeah. who was Kwame Nkrumah's very good friend, he set up a national record label. Wow. I mean, can you imagine that? Yeah. A national, which was called Silifon. Okay. And it, it existed up to probably the late 80s and sort of fizzled out. But from 19... 19- like 50, 56, yeah. all the way, and it's a national record label. So that is a proper archive of... That is, that is to show the rest of the world what we believe in. We believe our culture is king, so mm. there's a national record label strictly for contemporary Guinean music. So did we have one? N- no, <laughs> we, nev- we never had a national record label, but Kwame Nkrumah contribution to the arts was immense okay it was absolutely immense he used to anytime he went on foreign trips he took a band with him he took a high life band with him that was part of the of the entourage you know you had singers like um et mensa composing songs in his in in his in his honor Mm. you know so at that point in time music and politics became intertwined you know, High Life was the soundtrack to independence. Definitely. You know, I can imagine all the, the all the street dances, all the probably posh people. They were all dancing to High Life. It was the it was literally the music of Franca, yeah. of, of 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 Ghana, and that was via the efforts of these politicians who wanted to use music as a leverage as part of the struggle towards independence. Absolutely, and I think some of us can. Recall, you know, when it gets to independence, they show those old archive videos, Ghana, yeah. the land of freedom. Yeah, you know, yeah well, yeah. actually, yeah. that's yeah. Kitchener, isn't it? But yeah. yeah, but saying that as well, um, once again, I'm going to play another track that captures 
sort of the pre-independent spirit, you know, what was actually, hold on, what was actually reigning back then. Mm. And this is by, this is the seven inch. Yeah. Um, Uhuru's. Oh yeah, Uhuru, which we've been talking about. Yep. Yeah. So, um. so, as Bernard sorts himself out, Mr. DJ Volta, it's just to remind you, if you have any comments or questions, let us know, because we've got to grill this guy afterwards. <laughs> Make sure we get it all out of him. Sorry, Abby. I like the way you're quiet. Are you not going to say something? I'm trying to get me. Oh, I, th I thought you were almost done. <laughs> no, okay. It's, it's okay. I think it's almost <laughs> done now. Fine. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce this. I mean, as soon as I played, Patrick was actually here when I played this track yesterday. And Patrick was over, with, over he goes, yeah, I remember this tune. This is a bad tune. I'm like, yes, Patrick, you are very musical. Anyway, so this is um, Uhuru's with Ube Kumi. Ube Kumi, Ube Kumi, oh, Ube Kumi, Zimenyaka, Ube Kumi, oh, Ube Kumi. Ube kumi yo, ube kumi We di e menya kanse Ube kumi yo, ube kumi A huan febe fweni Mon shwene chi Bina mi si ese Me chinchi, me chinchi, mananti, mananti Nansu debi, 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 debi We di e menya kanse, ube kumi Bina mi si ese Me chinchi, me chinchi, mananti, ma bre Nansu debi, 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 debi Where the amenya can say Ube kumi to High Life Music Deconstructed. I was really feeling that song. I don't know if you saw us dancing in the break. Can you tell us where this would have been played? I mean, this song's really, really beautiful. Um, so this is Ube Kumi, yeah. which means... You're, you're gonna kill me. <laughs> you're gonna kill me. You're gonna kill me, yeah. <laughs> But I mean, I'm, I'm sure he was not physically talking about... No, I'm sure that. it's related to love and all of Definitely. that stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, something like this would have been played in a really upmarket place. Yeah. Like the Seaview Hotel. Yes. Or I don't know, it's a place like... 
I don't know, maybe the state house, yes. Yeah. The, state, the banqueting hall. Yeah. So. Um, very bourgeoisie, high, high, high society. No, so you can really there. feel that. Um, so, you know, just before the record was playing, you were talking about Ghanaians and Africans taking more control um, of their sort of, uh, of self-governance. You talked about self-governance. I'd like to find out if that was reflected in the sort of musical structures that we had. So were we owning more of our music at uh, that point? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And if we look closely at, um, one sec, thanks. If we look closely at um, industry structures that supported um, the musicians back then, um, there wasn't much, I'm afraid. Come um. the 50s, <laughs> 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 There wasn't much in the sense that um, come the mid 50s and um, everything was still being produced out so early 50s everything was still basically primarily being produced outside outside Ghana um, so we're talking about I think you mentioned Decca previously yeah, and Phillips so, so the usual suspects were there mm. Decca West uh, Phillips West Africa and Decca they had the bulk of the market, so they were in charge of probably um, flying musicians to the UK or wherever it is to record. Everything would be produced, yeah. mixed, mastered, and pressed abroad. Yeah. But come the mid fifties, mm. there were a few really indigenous sort of industrious Ghanaians who decided to go toe dipping so far as um, the the. The, the proper record industry was concerned. So, um, AMRL, so A R M L, Ambassador Records Manufacturing. I've seen Limited. that. I've seen that. Yeah. Yes. So, um, Ambassador Records actually set up a studio in Kumasi. Okay. Um, and the tracks would be recorded in the studio, and then it'd be sent over to the UK for pressing. And it come back from the UK with the ambassador label embossed on it, mm. <laughs> but then there'd be a little sign that says "Made in the UK." Yeah, you know. So that went on for a while. Um, even after straight after independence, we still didn't have any record pressing facilities, but we had really good studios. The GBC had a good studio as well. Okay. Uh, the Ghana, Ghana Film Industry um, Complex as well had a really good, which is now TV Three. Oh, oh. I I went there. It's really gorgeous. They've they've kept a lot of the old artwork and everything. It's yeah. beautiful in yeah. there. So um, which is now TV three. So that was in that, that that was actually in existence then, and that was what was used for for, for, for the recordings. Essentially. Okay. Um, but when did we start well, pressing our? Well, nineteen sixty eight, sixty nine. Yeah. Um, a gentleman named Dick a Silphy Bonesy of Essibons. He decided to sort of go all out and buy record pressing plant Pe equipment. Yeah. And he set up <coughs> he set up um, the first actual record um, recording. Shit. Bernard. He set up um, the first um, recording for. So that was around what what period? That would have been around probably 1968-69. Okay. So, so that, that was that was when Essibons set up his first record pressing plant. So just 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 to have a, a, a quick recap of of what I just said, um, there were no local players come the early 50s, you know, but come the mid 50s more industrious Ghanaians were able to raise cash, build recording studios, record the songs, the master tapes would be taken over to the UK, vinyl would be pressed and then shipped back. Okay. Yeah. But then that started to change and we had more ownership. We were able to do the whole process in Ghana. Yes. Yeah. That changed with Mr. Dick Asilfi Bonzi setting up his own record plant. Okay. Brilliant. Well, that's good news at least, isn't it? Yes, at least. Yeah, that's that's very good news. And I guess it would be both streams of music that. Would yes, I mean, in in, in it, it would be both streams of music because Decca was releasing um, dance band records. At the same time, the same Decca was releasing Yamwes band records. So okay. 
the record industry did not actually discriminate discriminate that much. Yeah. It was more of who's got the good stuff. We don't care if it's big band or it's guitar band. We just want to make money, really, record companies. Well, at least there was equity there. But I, I noticed that um, when you gave um, the sort of run through at the beginning, you talked about the demise of dance band. So what was going on and why was it declining? Um, I think if you look at the dance band as an entity in itself, I mean, you've got 20, 20 odd musicians. Yeah plus support staff. So maybe you're looking at maybe a sound engineer, maybe a runner, and then maybe a few groupies as you <laughs> <laughs> as you always as you always get. Yeah. So um to begin with, financially it was quite expensive. Yeah. I mean twenty musicians, all of them had to be paid. Of course. You know? So if it's give or take hundred and fifty pounds a head in today's money times 20, 20 yeah. that is a lot of money. Yeah. That is a lot of money. So financial constraints also play the part because not every promoter could afford to book them. No. You know, so it was still mainly the rich and the hotels and the, and the big banquet halls that were mainly um, um, sort of keeping them, keeping them going. But it got to a point, I mean, you, you can't do that forever. No. You know, you can't keep having such a big band and having to pay all of them. So financial cost was one. Mm. The second one was um, um, logistics. You know, you've got 25 odd people in the entourage. How are you going to move 25 people from Accra to play in a village in Sunyani? <laughs> a massive <laughs> you're gonna band. Need a, you're going <laughs> to need a train. Okay, you know? a train. <laughs> Because you're looking at the people and the instruments. It's true, yeah. You know, so logistically, it was a nightmare. Yeah. You know? So it kind of cannibalized itself. Well, more or less. It was of its own doing. And then thirdly, you had a technical aspect as well. If you've got... How many, how many spaces in Ghana in the probably late 60s, early 70s were kitted out to actually... Technically support a twenty-piece band. Mm. I mean, let's face it; there were places that could do that, but if you came like down to the grassroots, you had less and less venues that could do that. So technically, that was a challenge as well. Imagine how many microphones you'd need for a twenty-piece band. Well, at least one each, <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> well, <laughs> mathematically one each, but you add the drum, and no, it's gonna be it's, it's gonna be it, it could be twice as much. So it sounds to me like where dance band wasn't able to evolve, guitars because bands because they were a lot smaller, they were able to. Is that right? Yes, yes. I mean, guitar bands were able to evolve much quicker, much much quicker because they could adapt. Mm. I mean, it's an eight-piece section, so they were more agile. Mm. You know, they could play literally in any venue without any extraordinary technical requirements. You know, they could play in a village in in somewhere in Mampong. We're a town, okay? <laughs> Mampong's a town. <laughs> they could be playing somewhere, somewhere <laughs> in a town like Mampong mm -hmm. easily. Yeah. They could come to Accra and still play the sea view. True. Easy. True. You know? So I think the fact that the guitar bands were able to adapt to the rapidly changing society and the way people even perceive dance bands that is what kept them going so yeah. i think come to mid 70s there was a steady decline in the demand for dance bands and mm. the guitar bands were sort of they were ruling the roots come 70s the bands that were making the headlines which we're going to talk about in the it, third yeah. episode they were not dance bands they were all people that came from guitar bands or guitar band sort of set up yeah, yeah yeah i think it's quite um ironic isn't it because there's all that elitism and high life the word actually you know yep. all yep. of that sort of exclusiveness and yep. actually that sort of became their downfall in well the end. unfortunately they couldn't survive the changes the political sorry the social changes that were pervading then i mean it's it just wasn't viable anymore to have a 20 piece band plus no. five technical staff and 20 groupies, no. 
No, <laughs> get rid of the groupies. <laughs> but we still have the memories and we still have the music. And you, you've got some of that, haven't yes, you? Yes, we yeah. still have the memories and we still have the music. I believe we're almost coming to the end of this section. Yeah, we are. So what we're going to do in a few minutes is round up. You're, hopefully you're going to play us another song. Yeah, um, I think what we should do is maybe we play another song and then we get ready for your question. So we're going to play one more song when we come back. We do your questions. Yeah, and, and there's been there's been quite a lot actually. Okay. Comments and questions. Okay, questions. <laughs> so I've got a few here that they're sort of comments that um have come. Um the first one is from Evelyn and she is asking about you talked about the influence of Caribbean seamen. Okay, so I'm just going to read it out. Um, okay, what about the influence or impact that Ghanaian musicians had on other African musicians? Um, I think the immediate one I can think about is Nigeria. Mm. We started High Life. The birthplace of High Life is Ghana. Um, the impact it had on other musicians, well, it had, it had so much an, of an impact on Fela he came down to Ghana to do his apprenticeship in high life, that's what I'd call it, and then ended up creating a world phenomenon, um, Afrobeat. So this shows you that high life actually influenced other people a lot. I see that. Yeah. So you got the next question or do you want me to line up? I'll line up the next yeah, song and then, and then we'll take the questions. Okay, well, these are more comments, you see, from some of our... Um, some people who were watching the first episode. So this is Paulina in Cancer. She was talking about the Uhuru band, the dance band that you'd played earlier. Yeah. Um, um, Bibri. I'm not saying it properly. Bibri. 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 There you go. Sorry, <laughs> I apologise. I just like slaughtered it. Um, it's one of her favourite tracks, she says. Um, uh, Claudia George has talked about Tiptoe Club. Tiptoe, yes. Yeah. That was in Circle. Yeah, so they used to hold afternoon dance sessions yep. called Afternoon, afternoon Jump. jump yeah. Okay, <laughs> see, he knows. Afternoon jumps, yeah. Um, I think also, yeah, I mean, again, Charlotte Dada. Basically, people are shouting out some of the names that oh, you mentioned. Oh, that'd be great. So what, Charlotte, what, what, what the names have they got on there? Charlotte Dada, yeah, you I mentioned. Yeah, I mentioned Charlotte Dada. Legendary Potato of Osibisa. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, so those are the two main ones. But I think if you start with yeah. the record, then I'll have a look, because we're also on um, YouTube as well. Okay. So there may be some comments there okay. too. Okay.
Welcome back. Now, that was an awesome track. I really like that. Bernard, can you tell us a little bit more? Um, yes. Yeah, so what you just listened to was the Happy Stars. Okay. And they call this Son Son. I mean, bloody hell. I love <laughs> it. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, I think it's, it's a killer track. No, it is. Um, it's a seven inch and it's a killer. And it's really rootsy. You can really feel... Yeah, the vibe with yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's the main reason why I like it. It's really stripped down, yeah. and the vocals. I mean, I don't understand tree very well. Some of the vocals just fly over my head, but I just like the groove. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's got a really solid groove. We've got one more question. <laughs> this comes from a guy called Michael, and he wants to know if you've ever experienced the dance band yourself. Um. Well, I have experienced a dance band myself. I mean, I've seen the Rumblers, but probably about maybe eight, ten years ago. Okay. Um, I was in Ghana then, but it wasn't the original members. I was going to say, was, you don't look that this old. Was the, <laughs> this, was, this was more of, a, of, a, of sort of a, a tribute band of like a, a band with apparently one of the leader's son mm. is actually sort of taken over now, but it's not, it, I saw them at, where did I, I can't even remember where I saw them, but I did remember seeing them and it was amazing to have um, such a big horn section, which is like really rare in Ghana. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think I've seen the Rumblers and I saw A.B. Crento. I think the first time I saw A.B. Crento, I was probably about maybe 10, 11, mm. um, because my sister used to work for or the foreign affairs and they used to have like parties and they'd get these bands to come and play. So as a kid, I used to go to these parties and sort of, I remember seeing, oh, this man, he looks really special. But yeah. then it was A.B. Crento. <laughs> yeah, who is really special or who was? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Well, no, we we can tell it's in your blood. You're living and breathing high life music. Well, if I've been buying, <laughs> if I've been spending most of my time and my energy collecting all these records, so yeah, yeah, know, yeah. Well, you know, we're really grateful to have um, just been able to pick your brain for a little bit and listen to you talk so passionately about high life music yeah. so i think we're gonna leave it here for now but i know that the next episode episode three we're going to look at third generation high life so we're looking at the 1970s moving forward yeah. mid to are we going on to the 80s um so for third gen yeah to me one second well, while you <laughs> sort yourself out, um, you were saying third gen. Um, so third gen, we will be looking at late 60s, 68, 69, oh, okay. all the way to revolution time. So you're looking at 79, 80. And to me, that is the most exciting, personally to me, yeah. that is the most exciting part of, of the journey of high life. Okay. You know? So we'll be dropping um, um, in the information about the dates um, on our Facebook. All our platforms will let you know exactly the date. It's just because, as, as you all can appreciate, this is interesting times. So we just need to make sure that everything's all right. Um, we'll be dropping the track list as well. So if anyone wants to listen to any of the songs that we've been playing, we will do that. And also a link once um, it's on YouTube so that you can um, watch this again if you've not been able to watch all of it. Um, if you want to follow us, Bernard is on Twitter most recently. He needs more followers. <laughs> <laughs> he Come doesn't on. have many. <laughs> so he's on um, Golden Stool One. Yeah, yeah. Is that's, it that's, that's my new Twitter handle. And as she, as she said, please just... Don't follow me if you don't want to follow me. But no. Follow me if you like me. End off. Yeah. So, so just again, it's the Golden Stool. The Golden Stool one. one. Yeah. yeah. On Instagram, he's Golden Stool Project. Instagram Golden Stool Project. Yes. And Facebook, it's Golden Stool Project because you like to be different. 
So they're all different. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then a caddy mag for Facebook and also for Instagram and a caddy magazine for Twitter for 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 a caddy basically. Yes. Anyway, um So please. Yes, thank you very much for 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 coming on this sort of amazing journey um, so far as High Life is concerned. And I'd like to say thank you to Akadi Magazine as well. Um, it's been an amazing hour and a half. How long? Hour and About a half? an hour and a it's half. It's been an amazing sort of in fulfilled hour and a half. Um, we'll be dropping the next date, as she said, um, for, for the next episode three. Big shout outs to... You can't see him. But, but he's here. He's like, here, I'm pointing towards him. Yeah, Epishan. His he's name a... is Patrick. Yeah. And he is the technical producer. I mean, he's literally in control of the show. Well, he's been <laughs> giving you these really nice phased images and sorting out the sound and everything. And I hope you like the backdrop as well. That's the brainchild of these two guys here. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah, so thank you thank very you. much for sticking with us. I hope you've learned something. If you've got any questions, as I said, please... He's the man. He knows everything. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to play us out with one more track, aren't you? Yes. So I am going to leave you with, once again, paying respects to our mothers, our sisters, females. I'm going to leave you with um, African Brothers. This is called Anoma Sun Trophy and it's featuring Mumbi, the golden voice of Mother Ghana. That's a great way to end. Yeah. So thank you very much and... Catch you guys yes, soon. Yes, come back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, I'm out.